Thank you for watching. My name is Glenn Morgan, and this is We the Govern. Today, we're going to be talking about how I survive as a full time conservative activist. It's a question I get often. More importantly, how you can too, if your spouse will let you. All right, I oftentimes do get this question when I'm out making presentations or traveling around the state as I have for the last 11 years, and people always wonder, how is it that you survive as a full-time activist? So hopefully I can answer that question here. Now, one of the other questions that comes up is, well, what do you exactly do as a full-time activist? And that's a great question. Although I usually modify that as uh, really looking at what you do as a full-time conservative activist, because being a conservative activist is very different than being an activist on the left. Uh, the reality is that the left or the liberal kind of ecosystem that they have for activism really provides the opportunity for thousands of different jobs and jobs that support activism in that political spectrum. There's not so many out there that exist for conservative activists. And especially when you're in a state like, like I am in Washington state, which is much more liberal, um, there's very few full-time jobs that you would ever have and still be considered a conservative activist on that political spectrum. And there's very... It's even harder if you're going to be an independent person, as, as I have been uh, over the last six years. It's much more difficult. But what do you do as a full-time activist? It's a great question. Well, what I find is that one of the main things that I have done for many years here is oftentimes you go out and you make public presentations or you do training sessions. So this is a normal activity that you would do as an activist. I find it to be uh, one of the more common things I do, especially in the pre-COVID era, uh, oftentimes two, three uh, a week, you'd be going out and making presentations. Sometimes it could be to a formal group like a Lincoln Day dinner for maybe a Republican Party group or a Libertarian group, or even sometimes basic civic organizations organizations where you're going out and doing presentations, uh, even on college campuses, sometimes to high schools or Lions Club or other groups like that. So uh, that's a fairly normal activity. And usually those are not paid. You're just going out there and you uh, might be asking for donations. But generally, you're just out there making presentations, trying to educate them on a specific subject that you've worked on for a while. The training sessions are a little more focused where you're out there teaching people how to be better activists or teaching them how to run for office or teaching them how to do different types of activities to hopefully encourage more people to be activists. It's a good part of what you spend your time doing. In fact, this photo I think was from just a couple years ago here in Pierce County. Uh, this is another image actually from Thurston County from 2011. And I remember this was a uh, public town hall that I had helped organize. Uh, that was when I was at the Freedom Foundation, but I was organizing uh, a, basically an educational uh, presentation for South Thurston County residents about some of the critical area ordinance planning that was going on in the uh, planning department at the county at the time. Another part of what I spend a lot of time doing here is on my website at We the Governed, especially over the last six years, this is where I put a lot of time into writing articles or uh, posting videos here. Uh, I don't just spend my time on YouTube like I'm doing right now where I'm uh, publishing a video, but uh, there's a lot of articles, hundreds of articles that I've written there. And uh, I like writing articles because it gives you the opportunity to provide source links to original documents and to be able to get down into the weeds on sometimes some pretty esoteric, sort of very specific uh, situations that I'd like people to know more about. And there's a lot of research that goes into that, which really is part of what you have to do, I think, if you're going to be a good citizen journalist, which is part of activism and something I encourage as many people to do as we can get them out there doing this. Uh, investigative journalism, it requires one thing is meeting with whistleblowers. That's something that I have spent a lot of time is recruiting whistleblowers and sources meeting with them, vetting them, trying to see if they're giving you correct information, vetting the information that they're sending to you. And uh, there's a lot of articles that don't necessarily get to the website in the end. Sometimes there are things that you do the research on, you hand them off to other people who they might write the articles on. But in our state, for example, I've got lots of government agencies here that uh, people who work there will come to me with some problem about what's going on with corruption or incompetence, and they want to give you some information about it. And that makes it a lot easier to be able to start doing research research to vet uh, whatever they're doing or whatever they think is happening there. Sometimes this leads to stories where you're exposing corruption. I think that's an important part of what a citizen activist should be able to do, speak truth to power and question authority. And exposing corruption is a good part of what you would be doing there. 
Uh, this could mean confrontation, uh, well, confrontation, I should say, with elected officials as high as the governor's office in our state or uh, government agencies, federal, state, local. Uh, there's kind of an endless list in, of uh, people in power that you're usually going to be in conflict with while you're exposing or detailing what's going on. And particularly the people that grift off of the situation that exists now, you're going to have lots of these confrontations. But of course, as a citizen activist, as somebody who's going to be engaged and involved, you're going to be doing lots of things. Research, like filing public records requests, trying to get some of that information, find out if it's true or not. Uh, meeting with politicians and candidates or bureaucrats and whistleblowers or people that you disagree with oftentimes to discuss policy issues or stories or something else. In my case, I've done a lot of public disclosure commission complaints, uh, 620 of them, I think, that I documented on the website so far. And uh, these expose politicians or PACs or other groups that have violated Washington State campaign finance law. Public testimony, this is something very common for an activist where you're going to be testifying in front of uh, public hearings, the legislature, local government, places like that, writing voters pamphlet statements, oftentimes in opposition to tax increases. I think right now I have one that's uh, in Thurston County that I wrote recently with somebody else. And things like doing ballot title challenges where you're drafting legislative ideas uh, filing them and seeing if they might work as a citizen's initiative at some point in time in the future. So there's a lot of activities. You have no limit on the activities that you can do. You wouldn't have to necessarily do everything that I'm doing, but these are the types of things, mostly what you see here and what I've already spoken about, in addition to doing video production, that, uh, that I oftentimes spend my time doing as a citizen activist. So yes, this actually is my day job. All of those things, all those actions, all those activities, they do take up uh, more than just the day job. They're usually the evening job, sometimes the weekend job as well, depending on what's going on. So the next question that somebody would ask is why? Why would you go out and do all of these activities? Sometimes they look like relatively small ball. Sometimes the year there's a question, are you making an impact, right? And I think the most important thing to remember is that activism is something that can be in your blood. I mean, in this case, this is a photo from when I was uh, an activist at uh, Columbia University. And I was really engaged in that kind of was what inspired me to be an activist originally. But, uh, you know, like other people who go to college, you have some issue that uh, draws your attention and you end up confronting. In my case, I was confronting the socialists more than anything else. And uh, there was, uh, you know, you want to debate the issues, get involved. And it does start to teach you that in order to make a difference or make an impact, you have to get involved. And the future does belong to those who show up. So uh, that was important. But you also, I think, have to believe that you can make an impact. You have to believe in what you're doing, and you have to be willing to work for it, not just assume that somehow it's just going to wish, you know, and just fall on your head and make a difference. You get, have to get out there and work for it. And the truth is, you can make a difference, particularly if you work with others or you find people of like-minded interests and you get together and you're trying to go out and make an impact. So the next question that usually comes my way after somebody asks why and what do you do, and the question is how do you survive, right? Because that doesn't sound like a great way to make an income or make a living. And that's actually a really legitimate question because if you see what somebody does as a full-time activist, most of the time it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But the answer to that is pretty simple. I just go out and beg. I'm usually existing entirely on the charity of others. Uh, what they give me really makes a big difference. It's not a way to make a lot of money, certainly, uh, but you can definitely make a big impact. That's where activism really comes into play. It's not because there's a lot of money there. It's because the impact that you can make is really significant. I don't know if any of my uh, regular listeners would notice. I hope some of you have, but this suit is actually 11 years old. I bought this suit originally when I decided to run for office, which I did in 2010, and that kind of got me more interested and involved in getting back into that activism that I'd experienced in college. And uh, I didn't have a suit, and I'd been in startup companies and hadn't really didn't really have a good suit uh, there. And I won't say that I have a good suit, but I have a suit jacket. This is the same one I keep in my car, so whenever I am out doing a presentation presentation, and I use it when I produce my videos here as well. Uh, it is not the accoutrements of somebody who is well off, and it is not uh, going to get that much fancier than this when you're out being an activist. But it is something uh, that you need to do and you need to have. Uh, another thing that I need, and it's very important, that I get donated uh, to me. In this case, uh, this is the current vehicle I'm driving right now. My brother donated this vehicle to me. It's a Saturn View. Uh, it's a great car. I've been driving it around the state. I think I've put about 10,000 miles on it in the last few months. But uh, it is a little past its prime. If you look at the uh, odometer right now, you'll see it's at 307,651 miles as of the filming of this video. 
There are no guarantees that by the time you see this video, this car is still going to be on the road because it's uh, got oil in the water and water in the oil right now, and it is just limping through life, uh, cracked windshield, all kinds of other problems. I really don't expect this car to last too much longer, so like the previous couple vehicles that I've had donated to me, this one will probably end up in a scrapyard uh, before the next couple months are through. So I drive them until they drop and uh, turn them into the scrapyard. You can get between $60 and $120, depending on what type of vehicle you have. I've done this a number of times. And uh, then you just move on and get the next car. If you like fancy vehicles, you're not going to like being an activist in it because you'd be putting miles on them all over the place and you'd be blowing them up. But that's an example of how you can survive as an activist and uh, be able to do this full time, and especially putting the type of mileage I do driving all around the state. And the question is, who would want to live like that? <laughs> you know, who'd put up with that? And I, I think that a lot of this has to do with just how you grew up and what you need in your life. If you're working for a cause, you're willing to live a little differently than you would be if what you're trying to do is have a fancier house or having a nice car or doing other things. I mean, much to my wife's chagrin sometimes, um, you know, it's if you're able to get by on, on a lot less and you're able to live a lot more economically, uh, sometimes it's how you grew up too. Here's a picture of me and my father, uh, and we're in front of our house. And I kind of like this photo. It's funny to me about it. It's one of the few photos we have from that era when my dad was building our house and we were living in it at the time. Upstairs was a hayloft, and downstairs we had visqueen for windows and a piece of plywood for our front door. And obviously we were burning uh, firewood here to heat the place. And uh, we did have electricity despite all appearances to the contrary. But it's, uh, you know, it's not exactly living in the lap of luxury. It's uh, rural poverty. Now, I never felt that I was poor, but I mean, growing up that way, you're not exactly living a fancy lifestyle. So I don't have any problem traveling around the state, sleeping in uh, people's couches or their back rooms or in the barn or doing whatever I have to do to get around uh, the state and uh, meet with other activists or other people and help them uh, with whatever the problem and the challenge that they might have. So that makes a difference. I think that helps. So getting back to why would I care and why do you care about what I'm doing? Uh, now people ask me these questions all the time, so hopefully I answered that a little bit there. But the thing that I always like to end these types of videos with is what about you? Can you do this? And you can if you have the right demeanor and you're interested. Here's a couple things I always point out to people who are interested in being activists. Number one, if you think you're going to be full-time, start out part-time, check it out, because that's the best way to kind of ease into it and decide if it's going to make sense. Do not think that you're going to get rich. You will not, and you're not going to make a lot of money, but you will make a big impact. So I encourage people who are interested in making a big impact. If you're going to try to use it as some path to getting rich, I don't see that as being very realistic. You do have to believe in what you're doing. If you don't believe in what you're doing, please don't do it because uh, people can see through it if you're being fake. You're not going to fake it till you make it. You need to believe in the cause. I believe in freedom and liberty, and I believe that the activism that I'm doing is going to lead to improving our lives in those areas. Um, and finally, something that people sometimes don't really think about so much, but if you're going to be a good activist, I believe that you have to love people. You have to really enjoy being around people. You have to enjoy being around the people that you're working with, even with people who don't like you, even uh, people you disagree with. You have to enjoy being there with people. Uh, a test of this is, do you like doorbelling? Do you like going out into a community that you've never met anybody and just knocking on the door and talking to people? And that's not that you don't have doors slammed in your face, but sometimes you'll have really good conversations. Going to an apartment complex or a trailer park and talking to people who live there and find out what the issues are and the concerns that they have. I think that if you enjoy that process or that's something that has an impact to you and you, you feel like you're making an impact or you like it and you like being around people, uh, then I think that you could be an activist and yeah, maybe you could be a full-time activist. I want to have more people out there doing that. Unlike a lot of types of businesses who people who don't want competition, in the world of activism, there is, it is not possible for there to be enough conservative activists out there. I certainly don't want to be the only one. I'd prefer it if there were thousands of people like me out there doing this stuff all the time because, first of all, there'd be a lot more people to threaten, a lot more people to sue, and uh, frankly, we'd be making a much bigger difference if there were more of us out there. So uh, I encourage and try to train and get more people involved. But I also want to thank those who have taken the time and energy and uh, money and resources over the years in my quest for charity as I need it to just donate and help me at, uh, with my efforts as an activist. Uh, genuinely, there's no way that I would be where I'm at today without the help that you've given me. And it's not just in surviving day to day, but you know, sometimes it's being able to get enough resources to uh, get 
make that new project work or help those activists achieve something or put on that event or file that lawsuit or whatever it is that needs to be done. And that money has made a big difference. Your help has made a big difference for me. I couldn't be here without you. So uh, I think that that's just an important part. Being an activist is uh, different sometimes when you're looking on the outside, looking in. I hope I've communicated uh, adequately to you what the challenges and joys and opportunities are that exist in this world. And feel free if you have any comments, questions, or uh, anything else that you want to ask, uh, make sure you add those to the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe to We The Governed and share it with others, other people who might be interested. And I do want to end my video like I do on all of them, something that every Everybody needs to remember and know when they're going to be an activist or they care about the future of their community, the future belongs to those who show up.